Okay, I'm pretty excited about this one. On paper, this basically seems like a direct upgrade to last year's 240Hz OLEDs. It's using a 27-inch OLED panel as well, still 1440p, but it has a refresh rate of 360Hz instead of 240Hz. And this is a QD OLED panel by Samsung, as opposed to the W OLED panel by LG that's being used in last year's 27-inch OLEDs. And the QD OLED is supposed to be more vibrant and brighter. And yeah, finally, this is a flat OLED monitor with a glossy finish. Pretty exciting stuff. Now, I'm mainly playing FPS games, and yeah, it feels like this is what this monitor was made for. I'm not going to pretend that 360Hz is a massive upgrade over 240Hz, but it's yet another nice little bump in smoothness and motion sharpness. The high refresh rate also has a positive effect on lag. And with a total display lag of just 2 milliseconds, this monitor is pretty quick. And this is an OLED monitor, so we'd also expect the response times to be almost instantaneous. And that's exactly the case. That's a true 1 millisecond response time average, which is actually pretty hard to achieve with this strict testing methodology that I'm using. In comparison with the 240Hz OLED from LG, we get similar response times, but the Alienware has less overshoot. This doesn't matter as much as you might think though. This is the same transition on both monitors, and it's immediately visible that the W OLED on the right really has more overshoot. The weird thing about OLEDs though, is that this overshoot is only kept for a single refresh cycle. That's 4.2 milliseconds in the case of the 240Hz LG, and only 2.8 milliseconds on the 360Hz Alienware. And even on the 240Hz panel, this overshoot fades away so fast that it's actually insanely hard to spot, let alone on the 360Hz Alienware. In a side-by-side -side comparison, the overshoot really isn't a huge factor. The AW2725DF still looks better though, and then comes down to the higher refresh rate and the higher motion clarity that comes with it. Like at this point, we're getting close to the clarity levels of the best LCDs with backlight strobing, which is extremely impressive. Now the 360Hz refresh rate really is the key here. These two monitors are using Gen 2 and Gen 1 QD OLED panels, and they really perform great too in the response times department, but they just have more motion blur because of their lower refresh rates. And for some context, here's a 360Hz TN monitor, which still kind of is the benchmark for competitive gaming. And the XL2566K is a very fast monitor, but yeah, 360Hz QD OLED just beats it in my opinion. At the very least when we're not taking backlight strobing into account. Now the AW2725DF also has super fast response times at lower refresh rates, so these images look basically as clear as they can be at a given refresh rate, and the blur we're seeing is mostly motion blur. But before we get too excited about mixed refresh rate gaming, there is a huge caveat. So you probably want to run this monitor at a fixed 360Hz refresh rate anyway. See, adaptive sync flickering is a problem on OLED monitors, and yeah, unfortunately this monitor is no exception. In some scenarios, the adaptive sync flickering is maybe borderline acceptable for some people, like for example here in Valorant with a 340 FPS limit and pretty stable FPS. Here the flickering is rather subtle and barely shows up on camera. But to my eyes, this still is a bit annoying and I personally rather see tearing than flickering, so I'm definitely leaving adaptive sync turned off, and I also cannot recommend this monitor to anyone who's sensitive to either tearing or flickering for that reason. But honestly, if you're not super sensitive to tearing, this really is a non-issue. Just leave adaptive sync turned off. At 360Hz, tearing is kinda hard to spot anyways, especially when playing at high frame rates. So I personally don't mind it at all, but I'm also not playing a lot of low refresh rate games. Now, brightness is another sensitive topic for OLED monitors. So I was pretty happy when I took my usual brightness measurements across different window sizes and the AW2725DF scored a solid 245 nits, pretty much for all window sizes and even for full screen wide. This means that the Alienware should be a good bit brighter than the LG 27G R95QE, but it's actually not. It's kind of hard to convey this over camera, but both have pretty much exactly the same maximum brightness in these scenes even though the LG is one of the dimmer OLEDs out there and usually measures only slightly over 200 nits. So what's going on here? Well, with a black desktop wallpaper and a white test window, the AW2725DF reaches 245 nits no problem. But watch what happens when we put the same test window 
on top of real content. The maximum luminance immediately drops to about 205 to 210 nits. And that's pretty consistent. It's the same on bright websites, the same on dark mode websites, or on the techless Discord server. Link in the video description. So yeah, what is going on here? Like, if this was just an automatic brightness limiter that kicks in to protect the panel in high APL scenes, why is this monitor allowed then to put out over 240 nits full screen, if it can't even do that on a dark mode website? To figure that out, I've used a program that allows me to change the brightness of the background behind the white test window. You shout out to Ledoge, who created this and other great programs for monitor nerds. I have his GitHub link down below. So starting with a black background of RGB0, we again get about 245 nits, give or take a few nits. And that stays roughly the same when increasing the background brightness to RGB9. But watch what happens when we change the background to RGB10. The luminance immediately drops to just over 200 nits. And the weirdest thing is that this monitor actually gets brighter again when we increase the background level even further. Here at RGB241, we still get just over 200 nits, but when changing the background to RGB242, the luminance jumps up to over 240 nits again, even though the brighter background puts more stress on the panel. <laughs> like, that makes no sense to me and looks a whole lot like Alumware are trying to achieve higher nits in test suites that this monitor can actually put out with actual content. And yeah, when plotting the maximum luminance against the background level, this looks a whole lot like pattern recognition to me. It seems like this monitor only enables the high brightness mode for the edge cases that are only really common in test suites. And when doing the same test with the LG 27G R95QE, we see that it's actually even slightly brighter for anything than the most extreme scenarios. So yeah, I think Dell Anywhere have some explaining to do. Now I've also done this test in HDR, and whichever shenanigans they are doing in the SDR mode don't seem to apply here. The brightness in HDR behaves just like we would expect. There's a nice gradual decline of the maximum brightness to reduce the stress on the panel when the APL increases. So in this case, the typical white window on a black background test you see on the right is actually valid. This kind of makes you wonder why they rigged the SDR mode, but not the HDR mode. Funnily enough, the VESA HDR standard explicitly states that pattern recognition mustn't be used in order to qualify for their certification. And therefore, Alienware wouldn't be able to advertise this monitor as VESA HDR True Black 400 certified if it was using any of these tricks in the HDR mode. So yeah, seems like VESA HDR is actually a useful standard for once. Anyway, the dedicated True Black mode is actually pretty well calibrated, but its maximum brightness is kept to 462 nits. So I actually prefer the HDR Peak 1000 mode that reaches over 1000 nits for small window sizes. But in either mode, the HDR performance is decently accurate and high contrast HDR content looks every bit as good as you would expect from a QD OLED monitor. Now the same is true when it comes to the colors. QD OLEDs are known for their super saturated colors and this panel really delivers. 165% sRGB color gamut volume is even another step up from the first generation of QD OLEDs. Of course, this also means that regular sRGB content will look oversaturated. So with out-of-the-box settings, it's no surprise that the average Delta E is rather high. But Alienware also implemented an sRGB mode, which actually is very accurate. Like you could easily do professional color work with these numbers. Definitely one of the best sRGB modes I've seen so far. Unfortunately, that's not the case with the DCI P3 mode though. It has a massive green tint, which makes it basically unusable. And there's no way to adjust the white point in this mode, as well as in the sRGB mode, which is a shame. Now to make use of the full color gamut volume, I'd recommend using one of the gamer modes and dialing in some custom settings. And the results are pretty good. Of course, despite of the high delta E, which is expected as we're measuring a wide gamut monitor against sRGB. Of course, after full calibration and profiling, we're getting almost perfect results. I'd really recommend using an ICC profile for a monitor like this that has such a wide color gamut volume to keep the saturation under control, at least in applications that support color management. In case you don't have access to a colorimeter, you can download my ICC profile from the video description. And these are the settings I'd recommend using. Of course, you could also just use the sRGB mode instead. In that case, you don't want to use the ICC profile from the video description though. 
Now you can't talk about OLED monitors without mentioning the text fringing issues. I mean, I don't want to do a deep dive into different subpixel layouts of OLED panels again, so I'm just gonna link my comparison of QD OLED and W OLED in the description that explains all of that. But it's worth mentioning that the pixel layout of this new panel is a bit different from the first generation and even slightly different from the second gen. And it's now slightly closer looking to the traditional RGB stripe layout. Still, this is a triangular pixel arrangement, so the old fringing issue still persists, but it's slightly more toned down now. Still not a monitor you want to read a lot of text on, but it's great to see that they're improving. Now the reflection handling has also gotten better, and I find this monitor slightly easier to use in brighter rooms than the first generation of QD OLEDs. But that's only thanks to the flat panel. See, the curved panel works basically like one of those carnival mirrors, and stretches reflections horizontally, which makes them even larger and more distracting. So the flat panel is handling reflections better. Still, this monitor struggles with ambient light. The glossy coating and the low maximum brightness surely don't help, but there's also the black lift issues that QD OLEDs have. As soon as ambient light hits the panel, blacks will appear gray with a magenta tint. This hasn't been improved over the first generation panel on the left. So Matte W OLED still is doing a bit better with ambient light and reflections. Now in that context, what I find quite annoying personally is this additional space between the actual image and the bezels of the monitor. These are additional pixels that are needed for the pixel shift function, but that also means that they're affected by the same blacklift issues as the rest of the panel. So yeah, with a bit of ambient light, that means there's a pretty visible gap between the image and the bezels of the screen. And to make it worse, the whole image moves every three minutes, so this gap will be uneven on all four sides most of the time. Additionally, I find the pixel shifting part itself rather distracting while reading text. So I really wish there was an option to turn it off, but there's none in the regular OSD menu. Now, while we're talking about the usability, I have to say I'm glad to see that Alienware went with a reasonably small stand this time. It actually has a decent shape, so you can get the monitor rather close without getting in the way of the mouse pad. It's definitely one of the better stand designs out there. And it also comes with decent adjustability, but I wouldn't mind if it would go a bit higher. Tilt and swivel are also adjustable, and you can rotate into portrait mode if you like. Now for the most part, this is a very exciting monitor. It's definitely one of the best monitors for competitive FPS that you can get right now. After all, this is an OLED with insanely fast response times, and it's 360 hertz and it really does deliver on these specs. So naturally, it's another small step up from the 240Hz OLEDs that were amazing gaming monitors already. But I feel like the great performance of this monitor is being overshadowed by the brightness limiting shenanigans it does in the SDR mode. I mean, if the maximum brightness can only really be achieved in test suites, this feels a whole lot like cheating. At this point, I don't know if the AW2725DF is the only one that's doing this, there are quite a few monitors announced by other manufacturers that will use the same panel. And this might be something the other monitors do as well. Or it could be exclusive to Alienware. Maybe other Alienware OLEDs do this too? This certainly needs some more investigation. And this behavior might also be changeable via a firmware update, but I guess we have to see how Alienware responds. To be clear though, I'm not mad about the fact that this monitor only reaches 210 nits max with real content. The LG 27G R95QE is in a similar ballpark, and it's fine. I can live with that. But it's the pattern recognition that leaves a bit of taste. Like if it can only sustain 210 nits, cap it at that and call it a day. Anyway, thanks for watching. Man sieht sich im nächsten Video.